Hello, I'm Dr. Dustin Sulak, and it's a pleasure to be able to present to you virtually and hopefully sometime in the future in person. It's been about two decades since I've been to Costa Rica, and I really loved it when I was there, and I hope to have a chance to return. Today, I'll be speaking to you about cannabis for sleep, health promotion, and disease prevention. Uh, very important topic, so let's jump in. And I'd like to begin with what I've uh, seen as a, a phenomenon in the U.S., and I, I really couldn't find any good data to compare Costa Rica, but I, I, hope it, I hope it's better in Costa Rica than the U.S., but perhaps it's similar, that we are really doing a bad job with utilizing our healthcare resources as far as good outcomes. And, and the U.S. is really the example of the worst job possible. This data is very fresh from July of 2021, and you can see that compared to about a dozen uh, similar economic status countries, the U.S. is spending much more on healthcare, over 16, almost 17 percent of our gross domestic product spent on healthcare services. Yet despite spending that much, the U.S. really performs worst uh, out of all of those countries on the outcomes of healthcare. And if you kind of put that outcome versus spending data together, you see that we are even lower. We have the lowest performance in our healthcare system and the highest spending. And so why is that? What's contributing to this problem? And I think a lot of you are aware that this, in the end, the, uh, one of the things that's the most upstream cause of this poor performance and inappropriate resource allocation is the healthcare infrastructure and economics. But I think when you look downstream, we see a few big issues there. One is this over-reliance on monomolecular therapies, meaning for a long time, medicine has been focused on single molecule, single molecule pharmacology with the idea that we can use this single drug to address a single target uh, to have an outcome in what's really a complex adaptive system with many redundant pathways, homeostatic mechanisms that are always working. And I, I know that um, very often monomolecular therapies can be extremely effective and have been a great blessing to humanity, but we're starting to see their limitations. And perhaps those of you at this cannabis conference are also recognizing not just in the field of medical cannabis, but also elsewhere in medicine that um, multi-targeted um, multi-therapeutic strategies seem to be better. So that's something that cannabis just has inherently. Unless you're using some type of a isolated or distilled cannabis product, we're, we're usually working with a number of compounds that tend to work synergistically or cooperatively together in terms of their therapeutic activity in the body, sometimes their pharmacokinetics and bioavailability and so forth. It makes it a much more complex picture, but a lot more exciting and a lot of therapeutic potential there. But then I think another major contributing factor to the failing healthcare system in the United States is this focus on managing chronic disease instead of preventing chronic disease. And we allocate so many of our resources toward the management of chronic disease, especially in its end stages. Uh, it, it's very disproportionate. And I know there's many other problems in healthcare. I don't want to get started on all of them during today's talk. But I, what I really want to emphasize is uh, bringing our attention to the opportunity when it comes to preventing chronic disease. And an interesting question can cannabis be a tool to help us do this? Why is prevention important? Well, first of all, besides saving money and resources, it improves quality of life. It helps people uh, make their contributions to the world and live as fully as possible before they get sick or minimizing their risk of getting sick. So of course, pre prevention is important. Uh, and I, I think that goes without saying. When I uh, think about cannabis. What I've seen over the last 12 years in clinical practice using cannabis as a tool with a wide variety of uh, conditions that pretty much span every discipline in medicine, what I've observed is that the most challenging patients 
to the other fields in medicine. The, the most refractory patients come to me as a last ditch effort and very often they have incredible responses to cannabis. And how is that possible? And, and why is that possible? Why can I treat someone with a gastrointestinal illness and then the next patient might have dementia and the next patient might have a psychiatric condition or a neurologic condition, a musculoskeletal condition, chronic pain, a rheumatologic condition? Why am I able to see such good results with all of these different types of pathophysiology? Well, the answer is that I'm targeting the endocannabinoid system, which is a homeostatic physiologic system that's a master regulator of all these other systems in the body. So it's an incredible target in treating disease. And it just makes me wonder if cannabis can work so well in treating refractory disease, could it also work so well in preventing disease, especially preventing chronic disease? So let's take a look at that. Today, we will talk about cannabis and sleep, and this is going to be the biggest focus of this lecture. We'll go into cannabis and some of the data for cardiovascular disease, cannabis and brain injury, including stroke. I'll mention some of the psychoactive adverse effects and benefits of cannabis, and then summarize at the end how I think we can potentially use cannabis to promote health and prevent disease. So let's start with sleep. This is a big problem and a major contributor to chronic disease. Insufficient sleep is reported at uh, 30 to 35 percent of the general population here in the United States and is strongly associated with higher rates of chronic illness. And this association remains strong even after you control for many of the other factors. For example, one study found that those with the worst sleep compared to those with no sleep disturbance had one point, almost 1.5 the adjusted odds ratio for having diabetes, over twofold odds of having coronary heart disease and stroke, and two and a half fold odds of having arthritis. So you can see that even though this data isn't causal, the mechanism of action is there. We know that poor sleep is associated with more chronic disease and worse health. Even small reductions in sleep can have a big impact on mental health, especially cognitive function. Uh, just, just one night of less than optimal sleep can be measured in cognitive tests performed the next morning. And uh, in tasks requiring judgment, risky behavior increases as total sleep duration is limited to five hours per night. Depression and anxiety have high rates of comorbidity with sleep problems. And it, it used to be thought that it was the kind of mental behavioral health problem that was causing the sleep disturbance. But now there's more and more evidence that it's the disturbed sleep that also has a con contributory causal role. So this is a reciprocal relationship. And, uh, and that sleep promotion can be used as an intervention to improve symptoms in people with depression and anxiety when sleep is disturbed. Sleep has a big impact on pain. Disturbed sleep can cause hyperalgesia and the development or exacerbation of spontaneous pain symptoms. It's a risk factor for developing chronic pain, and it creates this vicious cycle where the patient with chronic pain gets a bad night's sleep, and that makes their pain worse the next day, and then that worse pain further disturbs their sleep, and they go on and on over time. Now, this vicious cycle includes many physiologic systems in the body, including the opioid system, the monoaminergic system, and so forth, the, the HPA access, uh, the pineal melatonin system, but the endocannabinoid system, is, again, is a master regulatory uh, regulator of all of the other systems mentioned on this page, and therefore is it, uh, probably a good target for addressing this problem. Sleep and inflammation. The pathophysiology of sleep disturbance involves brain inflammation. It's been shown that anti-inflammatory and immunomodulatory treatments can improve sleep even when they don't change the amount of pain that somebody's been experiencing, and that data is strongest in the rheumatological conditions. Also, cognitive behavioral therapy, which is still considered a first-line approach for insomnia, this is a non-pharmacologic treatment, has been shown to reduce levels of inflammatory markers like C-reactive protein and IL-6. And pharmacotherapy cannot replace behavioral, cognitive behavioral therapies and good sleep hygiene. But imagine if we had a treatment that could modulate inflammation as seen in these rheumatologic conditions, 
also promote sleep and potentially enhance the effects of cognitive and behavioral therapies, perhaps by promoting neuroplasticity and helping people go deeper into the practice of CBT, that would be appealing. And I believe that cannabis fits that description. Now, what about medications? Uh, so often in a medical cannabis practice, the goal of the patient seeing me is to come in and find something that's safer and more effective than the current drugs that they're on. And I think this deserves special attention in regards to the opioids because acute and chronic opioid use generally disturbs sleep. It's been shown to reduce slow wave sleep, suppress REM sleep, and increase awakenings and arousal during sleep. Now, I'm not saying opioids are bad for sleep in everyone, and some people with severe chronic pain that don't sleep at all, at least they get some with opioids, but um, a, a little different than what we're going to focus on in this lecture, but I must mention there are so many observational studies that have been published over the last 10 years that are showing that in practices like mine, patients with chronic pain that are dependent on opioids who initiate using cannabis are able to reduce and often replace the opioids. There tends to be around a 40% rate of completely stopping the opioids and using only cannabis, and then another 40% or so will reduce their opioids and continue on combined treatment. And so I think sparing opioids is another important place to, to focus on when it comes to uh, improving sleep in, in our patients with the use of cannabis. I want to talk a little bit about neurodegeneration. Uh, this is something that a lot of people think about, especially as we get older. When they think of preventative medicine, preventing disease and promoting health, they want to make sure that they don't get dementia as they grow older. And, and so a lot of these neurodegenerative conditions are associated with sleep problems. They're the early symptoms and contributing factors in these conditions. And the, the disturbed sleep is associated with a toxic buildup of waste products in the central nervous system. The recently discovered glymphatic system, which is most active during sleep, is this kind of fluid pumping that removes proteins like beta amyloid plaques and, and other toxins from the CNS out into the periphery and so that the tissue in the central nervous system can be healthy. It needs that fluid circulation and that lymphatic drainage. There's a number of latent infections that in most people aren't pathogenic, but as the immune system weakens, which it often does later in life, things like HSV1, chlamydia, and Borrelia, and also several retroviruses can become contributing factors or play a role in the pathophysiology of neurodegenerative conditions. So effective treatment and prevention of these conditions would require both adequate clearing of the toxins from the central nervous system and adequate immune activity to suppress these latent infections. Now, if we had a pharmacotherapy that was neuroprotective and potential anti-infectious and balancing to the immune system, this would be very appealing. And again, Cannabis fits this description. It has high penetration of the CNS uh, with uh, THC and CBD. These Many of the cannabinoids have been shown to have antimicrobial properties and immune modulating properties that tend to restore balance to the immune system. So another good fit for sleep and disease prevention. So let's go over some of the evidence for cannabis and sleep. Just to begin with, in 2017, the United States government funded and published this report. It's available free on the internet. Uh, they did a good job of uh, separating the data on medical applications of cannabis and all the data on the non-medical use of cannabis. And what they found in terms of sleep is, in their conclusion section, they stated that there is moderate evidence that cannabis or cannabinoids are effective for improve, improving short-term sleep outcomes in individuals with sleep disturbance associated with obstructive sleep apnea, fibromyalgia, chronic pain, and multiple sclerosis. Now let's dig a little deeper. What, what was the evidence that they looked at to kind of make this conclusion that there was moderate evidence? So I'm just going to walk you through some of it. And it starts way back in 1869, uh, German physician Bernard, Fran Bernard um, Franmuller reported in his tests of Indian hemp and a thousand patients with sleep disturbance that 53% experienced a curative effect, 21% experienced a partial cure, and about a quarter felt little or no effect. 
And I'd say that my results clinically are probably a little bit better than that, but still pretty similar. So not a, not a whole lot has changed. I'm sure that the products I have available uh, for my patients to use are higher quality, better standardized uh, than what he used, but I, I can't be sure of that. Now, the, the profile of the actual product, the phytoconstituents in there, the dose the route of administration, the timing of the dosing, these all play an important role in the capacity of cannabis to promote with uh, to promote or interfere with sleep. And I think that that's why when you look at the few, there's just a handful of sleep studies that have administered cannabinoids to human patients, the, the results are often inconsistent, but I'm going to walk you through a, a few of them. So this is kind of a summary of that polysomnograph data. Some studies have shown that THC can decrease sleep latency. That's a good thing, get to sleep faster. Some evidence that cannabis reduces stage three, but increases stage four and total slow wave sleep. So what, is, what does that mean? Uh, stage three and stage four are both in the slow wave sleep category. They're just a little bit different on the EEG. And so basically, if you're kind of shifting from stage three over to stage four, that might be even deeper sleep. So that might be a good thing. But anytime we see a drug changing sleep architecture, it makes us wonder, is this really natural, healing, restorative sleep? In this case, probably yes. But contradictory results have also been reported. And the significance of these changes might be non-clinical, not, just not relevant. Um, THC has more consistently been associated with decreased total REM sleep and REM density. That's the rapid eye movement sleep, which is an important part of healing and restorative sleep. And so decreasing that might not be a good thing. Some studies suggest that long-term cannabis use can result in some tolerance to its effects on sleep. And paradoxical arousing effects are likely with high doses of THC in people that are new to cannabis, and sleep disruption is a common symptom of cannabis withdrawal. So give too much THC to someone that's brand new to cannabis, and it could keep them up as well as cause other symptoms that are unpleasant. So a little uh, look through some of the clinical trials. So here we have a double-blind crossover trial in nine patients with insomnia that compared THC at three doses with placebo. What they found was that the 20 milligram dose produced the greatest reduction in time to fall asleep. It was on average 62 minutes faster than placebo. Again, this was a study done in people with insomnia. 20 milligrams of THC made a pretty big difference. There was a double-blind crossover study of pure CBD in 15 patients with insomnia, 160 milligrams of CBD improved sleep duration, no benefits at the 40 or 80 milligram dose, and CBD was shown to decrease dream recall. I'm unsure um, the significance of that, but sometimes decreasing dream recall can be a good thing, especially in people that have nightmares or uh, trauma-related sleep disturbance. Here's an interesting one, a double-blind four-way crossover sleep study of eight healthy young adults. So Previous slide showed two studies for people with insomnia. This, these were just healthy adults, and they were given this interesting combination of either 15 milligrams of THC by itself, or five of THC and five of CBD, or 15 of THC and 15 of CBD, or placebo. So four, four conditions. The, 50, the results were that the 15 milligram dose of THC caused no changes in sleep architecture but did cause memory impairments when they were tested the following day. I think that's interesting. So this was a dose that was strong enough for these people to have a cognitive effect the following morning. In other words, it was still psychoactive the next morning, but it was not disruptive of their sleep architecture. Now, very interestingly, the five milligram combination treatment caused a decrease in stage three, but not total slow wave sleep. So probably not clinically significant. The 15 milligram combination treatment similarly caused, caused a decrease in stage three, but not total slow wave sleep, but it did uh, result in increased nighttime wakefulness. Now, what I suspect is that that has to do with the presence of the CBD, especially because the same dose of THC, 15 milligrams, did not cause this increased nighttime awake, uh, wakefulness. So sometimes CBD can help with sleep, but sometimes it can actually disturb sleep. And I think that this study gives us a lot of information, even though we need a lot more data. What I take away from this is that 
probably if a person is taking a dose of THC before bed that does not cause any cognitive impairments the next morning, then that means it's probably also not causing disruption in sleep architecture. But again, this was just a study in eight healthy young adults. So we need a lot more data to confirm that. Uh, there was one sleep study in 27 healthy volunteers with 300 milligrams of CBD. It did not change sleep ar architecture or subjective measures of sleep. Uh, so again, my interpretation of all this polysomnograph data is that, and, and this is what I've seen clinically, appropriate dose THC is likely to be helpful and not disruptive of sleep architecture. Low doses of CBD may disturb sleep. High doses of CBD may be less likely to disturb sleep and may help with sleep. And this is something that's interesting about cannabis in general. There's often these bidirectional or biphasic effects where a certain dose will do one thing, a higher dose will do the opposite thing. And this is certainly what I observe in CBD, especially in patients that are sensitive to restlessness and hyperactivity, where they'll find that lower doses of CBD tend to be kind of stimulating and higher doses of CBD tend to be more relaxing. Now, what about obstructive sleep apnea? This is a surprise for most people, but there's an, a substantial amount of data on uh, obstructive sleep apnea with THC. This is a dronabinol, which is just a synthetic THC. Parallel group trial of 73 patients given two different doses, two and a half and 10 milligrams uh, versus placebo, one hour before bedtime. And you can see that the dronabinol reduced the apnea hypopnea uh, index by approximately 50% in the 10 milligram group. That's a really good result. Now, some of you are probably thinking, wow, cannabis is more like a muscle relaxant. If it's relaxing the pharynx, wouldn't that make sleep apnea worse? Well, actually the theory for how this is probably working is that cannabis has the capacity or you know, THC, endocannabinoids, it's really CB1 receptor uh, stimulation, has the capacity to suppress the autonomic nervous system activity. And it tends to suppress the branch of the ANS that's more hyperactive. This is how cannabis works in nausea and vomiting by suppressing parasympathetic response. So for people that have this high parasympathetic tone to their uh, larynx and pharynx, that, um, uh, that this could uh, potentially um, suppress that excessive parasympathetic tone and improve uh, their muscular tone and capacity to breathe. And what about chronic pain? This is the bulk of um, probably most of our patients. So um, several studies have found that can cannabinoid therapies improve sleep in patients with chronic pain. There's been a study on nabilone, which is a synthetic THC analog in patients with diabetic peripheral neuropathy, THC in non-cancer pain, smoke THC dominant cannabis and chronic neuropathic pain, a cr crossover trial in 29 patients with fibromyalgia, uh, comparing nabilone with amitriptyline, found greater improvements in the nabilone group after two weeks. So the, again, these are some of the studies that led to that 2017 uh, academies, National Academies of Health and Medicine conclusion uh, that there's moderate data. You can see these studies are small, but they're fairly consistent. There's been a number of nabiximols randomized controlled trials. Nabiximols is a pharmaceutical preparation of cannabis that contains both CBD and THC, typically approved for multiple sclerosis. Uh, this has been a uh, number of those studies have uh, probably the largest data set of placebo controlled evidence has shown that it is effective in helping people with those conditions sleep. Uh, um, about 2000 subjects and 1000 patient years of data in these nabiximal trials. That's substantial. And what about PTSD? I've seen cannabis help with a lot of different conditions in my career. If I had to pick one symptom that is most likely to respond to cannabis, it's probably trauma-related sleep disturbance. I've treated hundreds of patients with PTSD, and I've, I don't know if I've ever known a single patient who had sleep that was disturbed by trauma-related nightmares, who didn't get some benefit with cannabis. Now, I'm not saying it's perfect, it doesn't resolve the condition entirely in everyone, 
but it tends to help just about everyone. Here was one small study in 47 patients with PT, PTSD-related nightmares uh, given Nabilone. Again, this is a synthetic analog of THC. 60% experienced complete resolution of nightmares, and 13% had a satisfactory reduction in symptoms. I think individualizing the dose and the delivery method, which we'll talk about in just a few slides here, could have probably improved these results, but for clinical studies, there has to be standardized treatments, or usually require standardized treatments. Doesn't always, though. Another open-label trial of dronabinol in 10 patients with PTSD also found improvements in sleep quality and nightmares. And then there's been a handful of small studies uh, using THC or cannabis in patients with dementia, showing less nighttime agitation and awakenings and activity. A case report in six patients with restless leg syndrome, uh, five out of the six uh, no, all six um, it reported improvement. This is another uh, symptom or condition that I see in my practice respond very well to cannabis. Um, another case report of 12 patients, uh, 11 out of 12 found benefit with cannabis. So restless leg syndrome and dementia uh, also likely respond. And again, in these conditions, I just want to make that um, point again from a previous slide that these are uh, conditions where the nervous system is not functioning uh, properly. And if we could use a treatment that helps them sleep that has neuroprotective effects instead of neurotoxic effects, that would be preferred. There's been a number of surveys basically asking cannabis users does cannabis help with, with your sleep? And uh, of course, there's reporting bias and selection bias, but they tend to answer yes. As you can see on the screen, here's one with 409 individuals who gave data on over a thousand administrations of cannabis in the mobile app. And they reported that it improved their perceived insomnia levels on an average of four and a half points out of 10. This is interesting. A survey of non-medical adult use cannabis customers in Colorado. So these are people that don't have a doctor that's recommending cannabis to them. But still, when asked why are they going to the dispensary to buy cannabis, 74% reported they're using it to improve their sleep and 84% found it very or extremely helpful. Most of those taking over-the-counter or prescription sleep aids reported reducing or stopping those medications with the help of cannabis. They're doing this on their own without a doctor telling them to do it. And here's just another one, a mobile app that uh, looked at uh, responses from 991 medical cannabis users with self-reported insomnia. And again, you can see when you ask people, do they sleep better after using cannabis? They tend to answer yes. We, we do need better quality data but I think I'm driving the point here. Patients uh, think that this is helping them and it probably is. Uh, a couple uh, other little patient populations before we move away from sleep. Here's a recent data out of Israel looking at patients with rheumatological conditions. Uh, data was collected by a phone interview and they were basically asked to grade the effect of medical cannabis on their pain and on their sleep. And you can see here just broken down into a few different conditions. Fibromyalgia was the most prevalent in this group. You can see high rates of people saying, yes, cannabis helped me a lot with my pain and with my sleep. These authors concluded that medical cannabis has a favorable effect on the pain level and sleep quality among nearly the entire spectrum of resistant chronic pain syndromes seen or referred to rheumatology clinics, including inflammatory diseases, resistant to biologic treatment, biological treatment, although the effects of medical cannabis on synovitis one condition was relatively mild. But again, what is cannabis doing here? It's not just a hypnotic. It's not putting people to sleep, but it's helping probably through many mechanisms of action. And so um, let's, let's, let's talk about that for a minute. How does cannabis actually help people sleep? What's it doing? Because it's not it's not forcing them to sleep. It's not a hypnotic drug. So uh, one of the things that my patients report is that cannabis helps them feel very comfortable while they're lying still. And I think that's a great benefit. They're less restless. They're more likely uh, to remain peaceful in their physical body. And then my patients also report that cannabis kind of allows their mind to wander, where typically they're in these ruminating uh, kind of repetitive thought patterns that might have to do with regrets from the day or anxiety about the next day or whatever it is. Cannabis kind of gets them off that repetitive track and into thinking about other things. 
And then there's the symptom mitigation. So if somebody's sleep is disturbed by anxiety or pain or muscle spasticity or nausea or whatever it is, cannabis can help mitigate those symptoms as well. So I think it's a combination of helping uh, mitigate the, the problems that are preventing sleep and allowing people to get more into a state that's conducive to slipping off to sleep. But I do want to emphasize that even, well, even perfect doses of THC won't force someone to fall asleep and overdoses of THC can actually keep people awake. All right, let's get back to the slides. I want to just talk, we already touched on CBD for sleep. I've been really underimpressed. There's not a lot in the literature, but one case series was published out of Colorado with 27 adults with poor sleep. They were treated usually with 25 milligrams of CBD after dinner, mild benefits on sleep at best. Sleep scores improved in the first month in some patients, but generally fluctuate out of time over time. So unimpressive. Now, if I'm in a jurisdiction where my patients have no access to THC, I would certainly consider trying higher doses of CBD to help with sleep disturbance. By higher, I mean often greater than 50 or 100. And I would be targeting patients where it seems like anxiety is the prime obstacle that needs to be overcome because the CBD will be a mild anxiolytic uh, and, and work better for some people than others. But in general, I'm not super impressed with CBD, uh, with CBD for sleep. So uh, let's summarize the sleep part of this uh, talk right now. I almost always recommend THC dominant cannabis before bed in patients with primary or secondary sleep disturbances. I found that uh, low and moderate doses of CBD disturb sleep in about 10 to 20% of my patients, but some patients do well with CBD. Inhaled cannabis, which we haven't touched on yet, and is certainly um, not present in any of the data I showed you, except for some of those patient surveys using the uh, phone, at the mobile applications. Inhaled cannabis can be very effective for helping fall asleep if it's the right type of cannabis used at the right time and, and at the right dose. And people usually don't need much. Of course, um, if the cannabis, uh, if it's somebody that's doing this every night and they want to be kind to their lungs and their body, they don't have to smoke the cannabis. It can be vaporized cannabis, which is also effective. The oral or oral mucosal delivery is best for promoting sleep maintenance because it's got a delayed onset and a longer duration of action. And so I do have quite a few patients that use both. They take a certain number of drops of their oil or tincture before bed, and then they take one or two inhalations, and they get the rapid and the extended uh, duration of both of those delivery methods. Some people that take cannabis by mouth uh, it doesn't last long enough. Some people just kind of metabolize more quickly. And for those people, a capsule may be a little bit better than taking uh, something that's oral mucosally absorbed. And for patients who wake in the middle of the night, despite appropriately dosed oral cannabis, they can often just take an inhalation or two and get back to sleep. So uh, dosage, let's talk where the rubber meets the road. People that are brand new to cannabis that have no idea what dose of THC is good for them, I'm almost always starting them at two milligrams of THC. This works for some people, but it doesn't work for most. But my strategy for cannabis dosing in general is to start subtherapeutic, titrate up until we reach efficacy or until we reach adverse effects. And in that case, we taper slightly. Um, so that's uh, one, you know, it would be like this, start at two milligrams every other night, increase by one milligram. Uh, you know, most people will find uh, that their effective dose, or, or I should say their therapeutic window between, you know, something that's helping and something that's causing side effects, it's, it's usually in the range of five to 20 milligrams. I usually don't like people to go over 20 milligrams uh, because it, it tends to lead to tolerance building loss of efficacy. Uh, this can be reversed. It's certainly not permanent. And I, I do have some patients that just do better with a higher dose, 40 or 60 milligrams of THC, but the vast majority can stay under 20 and not risk building tolerance. What else? Like I mentioned earlier, you have to get the right kind of cannabis. Some types of cannabis are very stimulating and they will keep people awake. So you have to make sure you don't get that. Now, shopping here in the United States, sometimes you can use this term indica to find things that are sleepy. Uh, it's often very inaccurate. If you have the luxury of seeing a profile of the terpenes, you might find more sleepy cannabis uh, that has myrcene, linalool, and neurolidol, amongst some other terpenes. 
Um, but that's probably not the only contributing factor. In my mind, the best strategy is just ask the grower or the retailer, hey, people that are using cannabis for sleep, what are they buying the most of or what are they, uh, what's working the best for them? And then it, it can be very inter-individual in, in terms of that response. Some people, uh, you know, will say this is the one I use for sleep. And another, another patient uses the same one because it's very stimulating and she likes using it during the day. So people really do respond to these different types of cannabis differently. And then um, cannabis does not have to be used alone. It works very well with other herbs. And people that get a partial response to cannabis, and then I want to add in something else to help them sleep even better, I'm usually using an herbal combination of hops, lemon balm, valerian, and skullcap that a local herbalist makes. Very effective. I have a lot of patients that use both cannabis and melatonin. The melatonin can help address the circadian, circadian uh, disturbance that they might be having. And then cannabis and non-pharmacological -pharm treatments. We, you know, I brought this up before, but I really want to emphasize, don't just give people a medicine, whether it's a drug or cannabis or anything else, you have to attend to the cognitive and behavioral aspects. And, and these are just a few simple tools, uh, the gratitude journal, which just takes a few minutes, or this 478 breathing exercise that's very relaxing and stimulating of the parasympathetic system. So caution, again, some types of cannabis uh, can wake people up. Cannabis can uh, potentiate the sedating effects of benzodiazepines and other drugs. And so be careful of falls at night, morning grogginess, et cetera. Uh, despite that, when people are already on sleep aids and they want to get off of them using cannabis, I will usually titrate cannabis up first until they start getting some of these side effects and then reduce the benzodiazepine and then titrate again and if needed, reduce again or stop. Uh, so th they're not toxic to use together. You just have to be careful and uh, take uh, you know very small increments of cannabis titration and of benzodiazepine tapering. Important to note that someone who's doing well with cannabis for sleep, if they suddenly lose access to it, probably around 50% of people will experience withdrawal symptoms, most common of which is disturbed sleep. So this is actually a rebound. They're not just going to go back to their baseline of sleep. They might go to an even worse sleep than that. Um, on the other hand, I've seen a lot of patients use appropriately dosed cannabis for six or 12 months and then find that if they skip their dose of cannabis, nothing bad happens. They're still sleeping great, even if they miss their dose. I think that's more likely in people that are using their ideal uh, individualized dose instead of uh, people that have built tolerance to cannabis and are using an excessive dose. Those are the ones that are most likely to experience rebound and withdrawal. All right, let's move on. Can cannabis be used to prevent or reduce the damage of cardiovascular disease? Big question. Uh, I know we just had a big shift from sleep to cardiovascular disease, but this is one of the biggest killers globally, and I think this is an important question to ask. Now, if you look at some of the preclinical data, it's impressive. This tiny, tiny dose of THC in mice uh, administered two hours before and induced myocardial infarction before these mice were given a heart attack, improved the fractional shortening, so basically improved the capacity of the heart to pump, decreased the leakage of enzymes from the cardiac tissue, decreased the overall size of damage, and decreased the accumulation of inflammatory molecules to the area of damage. I mean, just incredible. This is a, probably a, a blood and tissue level of THC that a lot of humans are walking around with uh, something in that range, even from the cannabis they used last night, for example. So um, is there human data to kind of suggest that this might be happening? Well, well just a little bit. Uh, this is data from eight uh, hospitals in eight states, over a million patients that had uh, almost 4,000 report self-report cannabis use on admission. And as you can see here, the odds ratio of death was lower in the cannabis users versus the non-users. The, the odds ratio of intra-arterial balloon pump and intervention uh, for uh, heart attack, needing percutaneous interventions, the, the odds ratio of shock, all of these four were much lower in the cannabis users compared to the non-users. The only outcome that was worse in the cannabis users was the uh, rates of ventilation, probably because their pulmonary function was compromised by the cannabis smoking. Again, this is not causal. There's so many other things that could be uh, responsible 
for this association, maybe cannabis users are more likely to exercise and go dancing or have different diets or who, who knows, there's so many possibilities, but there is a signal here that deserves some investigation. If we look at uh, back to mice studies, we see that giving THC in mice prone to hardening of the arteries at a very moderate dose, I'd say that's a low dose for mice, um, this prevented the progression of atherosclerosis over 11 weeks. And you can see the pictures here. The mice that received the THC had barely any worsening of their arteries during, the, during their trial time. We know that in this study, this was uh, due to the effect of THC on the CB2 receptor, which is the receptor that does not cause psychoactivity and modulates inflammation typically, amongst other things. And you can see in this uh, diagram that the CB2 receptor can be protective in at least three or four different targets having to do with both heart attack and ischemic stroke. And it's no wonder that this is the case because our CB2 receptors are going to be stimulated by an endogenous release of endocannabinoids when we experience a heart attack or brain injury. So the idea isn't novel. This is actually what's already happening in our physiology. But what if having a little bit of extra stimulation of these receptors at the time of an injury or shortly thereafter, well, what if that could be helpful? And it seems like it probably is. Here's uh, a study that looked at um, 3,412 patients who had used cannabis in the past 30 days with several different types of cardiovascular disease. And what they found was before they adjusted for other factors, there was a reduced risk of cardiovascular disease in the cannabis users. Um, the um, unadjusted odds ratio was 0 0.65. After adjusting for age, gender, race, their body mass index, their income, their exercise, tobacco, alcohol, and depression. You can see that the odds ratio went up to 0.74 and was no longer statistically significant because the 95% confidence interval crossed one, but was almost statistically significant. So this data is suggesting that cannabis users may be a little less likely to have car negative cardiovascular outcomes than non-users. What was associated with negative outcomes. Age was the, the strongest association. Older people have worse uh, cardiovascular outcomes. Low income, surprisingly, or maybe not surprisingly, was the second uh, strongest um, factor affecting this relationship. Uh, depression, obesity, tobacco use, and no exercise. And then what reduced the risk, being female and being Hispanic, were statistically significant in reducing the risk of cardiovascular disease. Another study out of Pittsburgh, this was prospective. It followed people from age 7 to 32, 253 young men. And what they found was that greater cannabis exposure was associated with all of these beneficial outcomes in terms of cardiometabolic risk factors. So lower body mass index, smaller waist to hip ratio, better HDL and LDL cholesterol and triglycerides, lower fasting glucose, less insulin resistance, less, lower blood pressure, fewer metabolic syndrome criteria. Again, this is not proving a causal relationship, but now you've seen that the mechanism of action is there and the data is there that I, I think is strong enough to suggest we need to explore this a little uh, deeper in a way that lets us elucidate whether or not this is causal. Uh, this was a study that just came out last year uh, looking at people with hypertension already treated with prescription drugs that started using cannabis typically for, for pain. Uh, you can see uh, total THC, uh, the median uh, daily dose was about 20 milligrams, same with CBD. Um, 20 used oil, four smoked, and two used both oil and smoke. And you can see this reduction in both their systolic and diastolic blood pressure over the course of um, the, the month. Uh, oh, actually, this was uh, three months, over the course of three months of treatment. And so is this significant? Uh, yeah, the, the, the change, the mean arterial, um, let's see, the diastolic pressure went from an uh, average of 69 to 65. The systolic went from 135 down to 130. So basically, is four or five points important? Yes, it is. The threshold for blood pressure reduction uh, in other studies has been about 4.6 for systolic and 2 for diastolic in, in terms of reducing cardiovascular outcomes, you know, negative cardiovascular outcomes. So yes, if cannabis is having this 
blood pressure lowering effect. Again, these were patients with pain. Maybe it's because they were hurting less and feeling better. But uh, whatever the reason, this would also be protective. Now, what about cerebrovascular disease, stroke, uh, as well as a traumatic brain injury? So uh, one of the things with stroke is that after the stroke occurs, there's this process called the stroke penumbra that occurs over several hours or days and weeks where basically the tissue that has been damaged by the infarct starts to release its contents. And you get these uh, pathological gradients, typically of ions and glutamate, which is an excitotoxin. Uh, it's a neuro neurotransmitter, but in excessive levels, it becomes toxic. So you get this kind of domino effect where uh, the cells that die create a toxic environment for the surrounding cells. They start to suffer and die, and it spreads. It continues. And we know that we know the damage is going to get worse over time. In the U.S., there are no approved treatments for protecting the healthy cells, no neuroprotective uh, uh, treatments approved. Now, um, back in 2003, the United States government issued its own patent on the use of cannabinoids as antioxidants and neuroprotectants. This patent that's still owned by the federal government details how it's possible that cannabis could be used for this very purpose, as well as for slowing uh, the progression of neurodegenerative conditions. And we know there's multiple mechanisms as detailed in this slide, uh, not just CB2, which I showed before. That's only one corner of this diagram. CB1 also protects against glutamate toxicity. Uh, the 5-HT1A serotonin receptor, which is a target of CBD, can improve vascular supply. These compounds can reduce reactive oxygen species and decrease inflammatory mediators. So many mecha mechanisms for how both THC and CBD can protect in the case of a stroke. And this has been well explored in animal studies, lots of animal studies giving lots of types of um, uh, you know, experimental models of stroke. And again and again, both the endocannabinoids and the phytocannabinoids have been shown to reduce the uh, size of the lesion after they're given a stroke, reduce the amount of early and late impairment and improve the overall survival. In this case, uh, the meta-analysis was about double the survival in the animals that had received the cannabis-based compounds. Here's some human data looking at um, mortality with or without THC in their system after traumatic brain injury this, uh, out of 446 people. And again, you can see that those with THC may have been less, well, they were less likely to die uh, in this cohort. Maybe that's because THC was providing a neuroprotective effect. We have more data here on people after intracerebral hemorrhage. And again, you can see on the top line here, CB positive, 19% of those with cannabis in their system had no symptoms in the end, whereas only 3% uh, with no cannabis had no symptoms. So you can see this whole rightward shift of this uh, all the way to the death rate um, in, in these uh, brain bleeds. So again, cannabis could be protecting the brain. We need to know more to determine if this is a causal effect. But what does the, the large data set uh, show, uh, some of the larger data sets? So this was um, published uh, just a, uh, in 2020, uh, looking at um, does, is cannabis associated with more or less stroke? And what they found was out of nine, over 9,000 patients, they had about 1,500 positive for cannabis use. Before adjusting for other risk factors, the cannabis users had 50% decreased risk of stroke but after adjusting, there was no association. So is this a direct effect or is it maybe because cannabis is reducing their um, body mass index and their uh, glucose and insulin levels? It, it's hard to know, uh, but it's suggestive that maybe using cannabis in the right way could be preventative. And these were the, uh, these were the uh, other risk factors that were controlled for that broke that association. Let's get close to wrapping it up here. So how do I, you know, those are just three topics. Sleep, we dug into deeply. We looked at cardiovascular disease and cerebrovascular disease. How would one go about using cannabis to promote health and prevent disease? Um, so to begin with, using the lowest effective dose and avoiding building tolerance to cannabis, I think is essential. Why? Our endocannabinoid system is so involved in the homeostatic function 
of our bodies, keeping us healthy, responding early to illness and injury and disease, that we do not want to dysregulate the endocannabinoid system. Building tolerance to THC is a downregulation of the CB1 receptors, and that means that that person is also building tolerance to their endocannabinoids. So don't do that. I think that's that's a really bad idea. If we want to look at what's the highest impact way to use cannabis to promote health and prevent disease, hands down, it's fixing sleep in people that have disturbed sleep. If your sleep is great, then that's not going to be our first intervention for health promotion. But for people with poor sleep, this is so high impact. It can really affect their whole life. I can't tell you how many patients I've only treated them at night and they come back and they say their next day is so much better in terms of anxiety and pain and a number of other symptoms. I think that cannabis can be used as a tonic or an adaptogen to improve resilience to stress. Something that's not talked about a lot, uh, but cannabis can enhance health promoting activities like exercise, meditation, and savoring. And there's a number of survey studies that have asked people if you use cannabis, you know, how much exercise do you do or how often do you exercise? What do you think about cannabis combined with meditation and so forth? And it seems to be a nice adjunct to some of these practices, helping people get deeper into their yoga or deeper into their meditation or more likely to choose to exercise when they have a little bit of cannabis in their system. Now, what do I mean by a little bit? For this bullet point, I am talking about a psychoactive effect of THC. This doesn't have to be a strong psychoactive effect. It doesn't have to impair psychomotor coordination, but at a certain threshold of a THC dose, people will feel a little different, maybe slightly euphoric or more open-minded. Or um, what I hear from a lot of my patients is that they feel more connected to themselves, more able to see their life from a different perspective or see their problems from a different perspective and better able to find creative solutions to those problems, um, more at peace with uh, more and more accepting of their illness instead of seeing their illness as a tormentor. They're sometimes able to see their illness as a teacher. These are things that people have reported all the time and you don't need to be totally stoned and super impaired to experience these things. They, they can occur with very low doses. And I wanna bring that up and emphasize it because so often in medicine and in medical research, we see things black and white, like either we're gonna use cannabis in a way that's psychoactive or non-psychoactive, or euphoria. Is that a benefit or is that a negative side effect? And of course, everything has its place and its time. And, and I think it's having helping patients be able to use cannabis in an individualized way, including um, as an adjunct to some of these health promoting activities, including the next bullet point as an adjunct to social interactions. Creating deeper social interactions has been shown to be associated with improvements in uh, rates of chronic disease. And especially in our post COVID world with so much social isolation, I think that this is really important. So I encourage people to not every day, not all the time, but understand how to incorporate these psychoactive benefits in the life. I do think they are a big part of health promotion and disease prevention. If you want to be super healthy, then you're probably not going to be wanting to smoke cannabis all the way, all the days of your life. That smoke has toxic compounds in it, um, even though it's been shown that people who have uh, pulmonary uh, symptoms due to cannabis smoking. When they stop smoking, they're able to reverse those symptoms. Uh, Long-term heavy cannabis users don't have higher rates of emphysema or COPD, but they do have more cough and more chronic bronchitis that is reversible. And so you can limit combustion by using cannabis as a vaporizer. And then uh, finally, I think one of the methods of consumption of cannabis that's underrated and underutilized is drinking cannabis tea. It's non-psychoactive. It's not going to have high levels of THC in it unless you add a creamer. It, it gives the acidic cannabinoids, which are anti-inflammatory. They have some pro-metabolic effects. A very nice way to use cannabis as a health-promoting tonic is simply to make tea out of it. I want to thank you very much. I want to show one thing for those clinicians uh, that are interested in a guide. It's in English for better or worse, uh, but this is a book that I came out with this year, uh, back in June of, uh, well, June of 2021. It is written for clinicians. It's got 
everything we talked about and more. And it's a kind of the soup to nuts solution if you really um, want to benefit from my 12 years of experience working with patients, as well as a lot of research. There's um, hundreds of peer reviewed citations. Consider checking out my book. Thank you so much for your time and attention. I hope that this helps you think of cannabis, not just as a therapeutic for symptom mitigation, but also as a potential tool for staying healthy and preventing disease.